Pennsylvania, uh, went on to earn her master's degree, uh, master's of science from Mississippi State University in 2018 with a degree in wildlife fisheries and aquaculture. And she's been with the commission for the last three years as the Arkansas River biologist and a big part of her duties are conducting fish population sampling and, and habitat uh, effort coordinations on the Arkansas River from Oklahoma to the confluence with the White and Mississippi Rivers down in southeastern Arkansas. Chelsea, it, the floor is yours. Take it away. All right. So thank you for the introduction, Trey. Today I'm going to talk about the first year of a uh, two-year study on the Arkansas River conducting uh, catfish stock assessment up and down the river, and these results are going to focus primarily on blue catfish. So jumping right in, um, the Arkansas River is managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it's also managed as the McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System. This is a series of 11 locks and dam systems within the Arkansas portion of the river, and it's currently managed to maintain a nine-foot navigable channel for the transportation of goods. However, a lot of people recognize her as an abundant catfish fishery. If you do a quick search of Facebook, you'll see a lot of these comments, these fish that were taken, with quotes such as, that river holds monsters, and we caught this monster, and as you blue catfish and blackhead catfish. As far as catfish management within um, the Arkansas River, we have recreational fishing, which follows a statewide limit of 10 catfish combined, regardless of species. And you're also permitted to harvest an additional 10 channel catfish um, just on the river above the state uh, bag limit. And the Arkansas River also supports an abundant commercial fishery, managed with a 16 inch minimum length limit for catfish. And it's important to know that we currently don't require any type of mandatory monthly commercial reporting. We don't know a lot about what commercial anglers are harvesting um, and removing from our fishery. However, one caveat I will add is that in 2022, uh, we are working to get that changed and monthly commercial harvest reports will be required for all commercial anglers. So that's a good step in the right direction as far as understanding the implications of commercial harvest and exploit populations. This information was taken from uh, a 2017 statewide licensed resident angler survey. And the results of this study, um, as far as catfish and showed that it's a pretty harvest-oriented fishery with 47.4% of respondents indicating that they usually eat the fish that they catch. Um, and they, many, almost half of the respondents identified the Arkansas River as um, the primary locations for targeting catfish. And you'll also see here that the predominant uh, number of respondents use rod and reel fishing methods. Catfish anglers can be difficult to get at as far as our uh, different survey techniques because they tend to be underrepresented by our creel surveys. They're often bank anglers and they're often fishing at night. So they often tend to be underrepresented um, as, far as, our, as far as their exploitation and use patterns go. There is also a commercial fishing license uh, holder survey that was also conducted in 2017. And from this, we gathered that one third or 26.8% of commercial anglers identified the Arkansas River as their primary fishing location. Um, and that total the total effort in days that were commercially fished on the Arkansas River, two thirds of which indicated they were targeting catfish. So as you can see, uh, by these images, commercial harvest has the potential to harvest high numbers of fish in a relatively short period of time. And within Arkansas, we have various commercial gears that you can use from gill nets, hoop nets, and then these uh, fiddler slap traps. So here we are at the project objectives for this study, which were in short to first describe population demographics. We haven't conducted any type of comprehensive catfish analysis along the river. There have been some uh, 
small pieces of information that you can glean from krill surveys and harvest information, things like that, but nothing has ever been comprehensive and on a river-wide scale. So we don't really know at our current a lot about the size and age structure, our growth, our mortality, and our recruitment uh, trends for the river. And so the next uh, was to model the predicted responses to various range for catfish. So if you remember, I said that we have a 16-inch length limit for uh, commercial harvest. We don't have a lot of ways to currently evaluate whether that regulation is protecting our populations from over-harvest or if it's even an effective regulation. So we wanted to test several different regulation options um, and see those responses for blue catfish populations in the river. So for our survey, uh, our study area again took place in five pools of the Arkansas River, which span from the Oklahoma border down to the confluence of the Mississippi River. The first pool that we sampled was Pool 10, also known as Lake Dardanelle, outside of Russellville, Arkansas. The next one we did was Pool 8. It doesn't have a fun name, but it's outside of the Conway area. And we also surveyed or sampled the Little Rock Pool, Pine Bowl, and finally Pool 2, better known as Dumas. Again, this is part of our study. So in 2019, we did completed our survey design to target primary blue, primarily blue catfish, whereas 2020 we sampled more flathead habitat. Um, sampling was conducted low frequency electrofishing uh, with a chase boat. So essentially you have one fishing boat um, shocking the length of the transect, which was 10 minutes of effort per site. And then you have a chase boat zipping around, collecting all of the fish that are surfaced um, in the distance that are out of reach of the electrofishing boat. And the use of a chase boat has been shown to drastically improve catch rates for low frequency catfish uh, electrofishing. So for our design, we used a systematic random sampling design where the starting location for each uh, the pools were generated from the lowermost dam, and we sampled a standard 15 sites per pool. So you'll notice that each one of these pins here represents a site, and they are all equally distanced uh, against each other. However, what makes it random is that this first site distance between the dam indicated here and the black bar through to the first site uh, was generated using a random number. So as part of the age and growth component of this study, um, we needed a hard structure to collect in order to determine our ages. So we used pectoral spines, which are the spiky parts that tend to stick people in the hands and legs and cut your fingers up. Um, we collected pectoral spines from 10 fish per 25 millimeter or one inch group from all pools. This ended up in totaling over 1200 spines across the river. Every one of these spines was thin sectioned using a low speed diamond blade saw here in orange. And those uh, spines were sectioned, articulating process indicated by this black dashed line here. And essentially, it is a pretty picture like this when viewed through a microscope. In a perfect world, you get an image that looks like this, where you simply count the annuli or these black lines which represent periods of slow growth and so here you can see this we would call this fish an age of one two three and four over here however uh, this isn't a perfect world so these pictures are not always as cut and dry as what we've seen previously there's a little bit of messiness blurriness and interpretation that goes into it so we uh, aged each structure using two independent readers. So each person would look at these digital images and assign each fish an age. And then we compared what each person aged those fish. And if we agreed, then that fish was assigned the age that was agreed upon. And if there were this, we had to come to some type of agreement or reconcile it. And if we couldn't, then that fish was simply tossed out because we couldn't agree. We had an overall disagreement rate of about 70% across those 1,200 plus spines. 
Uh, some of our sampling data, you'll from 2019 sampling, blue catfish dominated the species proportion, uh, as we could expect because we were primarily targeting their preferred habitat along main channel borders out to about 30 feet. Um, and here, one interesting finding that you might notice is that channel catfish are relatively underrepresented um, in the sampling, and that's because the low frequency electrofishing that we use to target these fish is really the most effective method for catching channel catfish. But for the sake of our study, we're primarily focused on blue and flathead catfish. Some of our link data that you can see, um, we have the millimeters and inches here for those of you that are not metric friendly. Um, our maximum length of fish was collected from pool two or Dumas, which was just under 38 inches. And here you can see that our mean lengths across each one of these pools were relatively similar to each other. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of difference, just a matter of maybe three inches or so. And another interesting finding is that catches of catfish exceeding that 30 inch mark or 750 millimeters were highest from pool two over 20 fish over 30 inches through our scene. Um, one of the most common questions I get was what was the heaviest fish? Uh, and we don't use weights too much uh, as an interpretive metric, but that answer is about 30 pounds, 35 pounds. Next, we're going to look at our length frequency distribution. On the x-axis, we have each one of those one inch or 25 millimeter inch groups. And on the y-axis, we have the frequency of how many fish are within those groups. So as you can see, uh, these frequency plots generally displayed leftward skewedness, which is to be expected uh, as you move towards collecting larger fish, you collect fewer and fewer. Um, we did test these length frequency distributions against each other to see if they were significant and we did that using a Kolmogorov smirnov test because these data are not normally distributed. Um, and all of the length frequency distributions were significantly different from each other among all pools except for pool A here. Next, moving into some of our sampling metrics. Uh, again, we sampled 15 sites per pool. This N metric here uh, represents the total number of blue catfish collected from each pool. So we collected or we sampled over 2,000 blue catfish total um, from 250 to 530 fish uh, per pool, respectively. Here, looking at our catch per unit effort, which is measured in fish for, per hour, this is a metric of relative abundance, and these uh, values are pretty high, ranging from 99 to 200, generally falling over 100 fish per hour. We tested these for significant difference among catch rates by pool using a single factor ANOVA, and found that catch rates were not significantly different uh, across these pools, but we do have relatively high catch rates across the board. And the next metric we assessed was relative weight. This is generally uh, referred to as relative condition of fish in the population. Values ranging uh, exceeding 90 are considered to be in good condition. So uh, the lowest value we got was 89, close enough to 90 to consider these populations to be in good condition. Next, we're going to at our size structure indices, proportional size distribution, PSD the preferred size uh, fish, and PSDM is a memorable size fish. And this is the proportion of the population that falls into these length categories of 20, 30, and 35 inches. Um, and these are standard for the species. So as you can see, Dardanelle had a pretty low uh, PSD of quality sized fish despite having the highest catch rate of over 212 fish per hour. And what we can glean from that is it suggests a pretty high abundance of smaller species, which is also supported by distributions showed earlier. We'll also notice that uh, Pool 2 Dumas had the highest PSD, PSDP, and PSDM values, which is to be expected seeing as we had the highest number of fish exceeding that 30-inch mark 
from that pool. But overall, aside from Darden Allen Pool 2, our PSD and PSDP values are pretty similar across these, each one of these pools and all of the data combined. Test whether our growth, how our growth compared among pools. Um, and to formulate these growth curves, we need inputs of three parameters, uh, an L infinity metric, which is the mean length, a K value, uh, which is a growth coefficient, which is not the same as a growth rate. And the final metric is what is called a T0, which is the average length of time that a fish is a length of zero. These parameters have to be used to fit the model and to the age and length data. So as you can see, these metrics are pretty similar across each and pool data and our max age range isn't very variable Little Rock. So from this figure here, um, in green, we have the Little Pool, and in red, we have Dumas. Uh, compared to both curves, we can see that the Little Rock Pool, or Dumas, shows the fastest growth rate up to about age six indicated here where then Little Rock shows the fastest growth, uh, but it also has the lowest maximum age of age 14. In general, from this plot, though, we can see that growth appears to be fairly similar to pools. We did test these growth curves for significant difference using um, multiple comparison and AIC models, and they didn't provide any significant evidence to show that growth is variable. So I'd like to just kind of cap back to where we have come up to here. Uh, all of the information that we've presented so far uh, provides support that there's not enough evidence to support managing the blue catfish population in the river uh, differently by pool. So all of the model simulations that we're going to talk about as our second part of our objective are going to be made up of all of the data pooled together and not by a pool basis. So here in this plot, you can see our growth curve for po the pooled data, so averaged across those curves you saw in the previous plot. In order to simulate populations, we have to see what various regulations we want to test against the population. Um, and since this is the first stock assessment of its kind to be completed on the Arkansas River, we're considering this kind of a ground zero point. To begin, we wanted to see what the effect of a no size restriction regulation was, which is the seven millimeter population uh, here. It, but it's unlikely that people are going to keep a seven inch catfish. Most people are going to toss that back. Um, next, we wanted to test the effectiveness of our current commercial regulation, which is a 16 inch millimeter or minimum length limit. And then these 20 and 24 mil inch, um, minimum length limit are an intermediate step up if the 16 minute, 16 inch minimum length limit is not substantial enough for protecting against overfishing and the 24 inch uh, MLO was provided support from a recent study on the Missouri River. And this 30 inch minimum length limit essentially uh, simulates no harvest where people are going to be catching very many fish over 30 inches to harvest to begin with. So one of the first steps in under in modeling population understanding of mortality and beginning step for that is rating a catch curve. So a catch curve is a plot of the natural log of catch at each age plotted against age. The slope of this line here is what is going to give us an estimate of instantaneous mortality or Z, um, which you will notice from the y-axis is on a logarithmic scale. This can tell us how many fish are dying in an instant. However, it's not used real-time scale, so we need to convert this Z metric to A, which represents our total annual mortality rate, which is the total number of fish, the percentage of fish dying annually. So from this, um, using this uh, equation here, we get at an A, or total annual mortality, of about 26.3% across all data pooled together. Since we know our annual mortality rate for each pool, which was shown here in column A. The next step is determine what rate of exploitation we want to examine. Actual can be determined by methods such as curl surveys or tagging studies, but those haven't been done on the river, so starting uh, based on our best guess. 
incorporating our estimate of annual mortality, and we know that our exploitation rate cannot exceed that uh, total annual mortality um, because those are the total number of fish dying from the population. So basically, we have to make an educated guess, and to do that, we decided upon uh, an exploitation rate of 5%, 10%, and 15%. Um, and these values of CM and CF represent our conditional natural uh, mortality and our conditional fishing mortality. So conditional fishing mortality we can get at is pretty similar to what our exploitation rate is. However, conditional natural mortality is a little bit more difficult to get at. Hard to know what number of fish are dying um, on, under natural circumstances. But as you can see, these CM values among pools are pretty similar. Um, again, supporting that we don't need to manage the river as discrete management units. So our first population simulation was a yield per recruit model, and this is used in the effects of length, multiple length limits, the harvest and number of fish, and our yield and weight. And this can help identify the potential for growth over fishing, where fish are harvested before reaching their growth potential. And we used uh, varying rates of our conditional natural mortality, again, because it's difficult to get at, and it's low, moderate, and high um, with our next plot. So these are the results from the yield per recruit model. Um, these are our yield curves here. As you move through uh, each one of these scenarios, you see that natural mortality varies with their corresponding exploitation rates. And you'll notice that the x-axis represents the range of exploitation rates simulated across, and the y-axis represents the total yield in terms of kilograms. So as you move from the high to the low conditional natural mortality scenarios, you'll notice that the y-axis values increase with increasing exploitation. This makes sense because the fish population is being exploited more, so the total amount of fish flesh uh, and weight is being moved as well. Again, these yield curves are useful for identifying what exploitation rates growth of for fishing has the potential to occur, identified by where these limbs start to descend. So under our high natural mortality scenario, the seven inch minimum length limit has the potential to decrease yield, but only when our exploitation rate exceeds 20%. And the 16 and 20 inch uh, minimum length limits are close to maximizing yield across exploitation rates uh, without uh, showing any type of decrease. Under the conditional mortality uh, scenario, you'll see that a 16-inch minimum length limit decreases yield only when exploitation exceeds 40%, which is highly unlikely to see an exploitation rate that high. Although the 16-inch minimum length li limit does have a descending limb, which might be indicative of growth over fishing, it doesn't occur until around 40%, again, making it unlikely. And similarly, a 20-inch minimum length limit, but is still very close uh, to the 16-inch minimum length limit, as long as uh, exploitation isn't over 20%. And under the low uh, conditional mortality, we see decreases in yield at our 7, 16, and 20 inch minimum length limits if yield uh, exceeds 30%, but again, pretty, pretty unlikely there. The conclusions from our uh, yield per recruit are that a 16 inch minimum length limit does not lead to reduced yield as long as the exploitation rate uh, stays below 30%. A recent study on the Missouri and Mississippi rivers by the Missouri Department of Conservation documented exploitation rate as 10% and 13.7%. So if we have a 30-inch threshold, we're, we're pretty pretty good in the clear, assuming that we have similar exploitation systems. These plots all show that we have a low potential for growth over fishing occur across all scenarios, even with a no minimum length limit regulation of seven inches, exploitation still had to exceed 20% in order for growth over fishing to occur. And these models tell us that we definitely need to understand our exploitation rate, which is going to help inform which regulation produces the highest yield uh, and limits that 
that potential for overfishing to occur, but it's highly dependent on our rate, uh, which determines our natural mortality rate. Um, so in addition, one of the we did with the yield per recruit model is to calculate our spawning potential ratio. This is used as the reproductive fitness of the stock. So it is the uh, what the reproductive output of an average recruit would be, assuming that uh, fishing is not occurring. This model requires input requires a fecundity length relationship, which was developed by Kohlauer in 2009, uh, seen here. And it also requires an age generation. The Kohlauer study uh, determined that no fish on the Mississippi River were reproductively mature at less than 20 inches. So we used our mean length at age to determine at what uh, what size age a 20 inch fish is, which for all data pooled was about eight uh, years of age. And you can see that our ages at maturity among pools are relatively similar. And so the spawning potential ratio can be used to identify recruitment overfishing, which is a more severe uh, version of growth overfishing where a high proportion of large fish are harvested uh, they're reducing the fisheries fecundity, and that cutoff generally accepted for SPR is uh, 20%. So we have our SPR plots here. Uh, the point at which any of these curves cross the black dashed line represents when SPR falls below 20% and recruitment over the potential to occur at the mutation rate. In general, we expected our no harvest or seven inch minimum length limit to reduce SPRs, which uh, indicated recruitment over fishing potential because there's no protection for those fish to reach larger, si larger reproductive sizes. However, given that our current regulation is for a 16 inch minimum length limit, the, let, the red line with squares is mostly what we're concerned at evaluating here. So we can see that under the high natural mortality and moderate natural mortality scenarios, as long as exploitation stays uh, below 30%, the 16 inch minimum, minimum length limit is effective at protect, protecting against growth overfishing by ensuring that enough fish are surviving enough to reproduce. You'll also notice from these plots that a 24 inch and 30 inch minimum length limit never fall below that 20% uh, SPR cutoff. And so our SPR conclusions are that recruitment overfishing uh, potential is relatively limited, uh, visualized by the yield curves. A 16 inch minimum length limit would protect SPR from falling below that 20% cutoff under all uh, conditional natural mortality, as long as exploitation did not exceed around 25%. Again, judging from the Missouri study, 25% gives us quite a bit of wiggle room there. But if we wanted to be more conservative, a 20 inch limit would protect SPR from falling below that threshold as long as exploitation did not exceed 40%. And again, no concern at our 24 and 30 inch minimum length limit. Our final population simulation we used was the dynamic pool model. This is an age structured model which assumes variable conditional natural and conditional fishing mortalities depending on our age. We use a program called FAMS, and here you can see our model inputs for our mortality options. Over a size of a range of ages, we assume that these different ages are impacted by the effects of natural mortality and mortality differently uh, to simulate across that. Think back uh, to what's going to affect a, a fish under predation, harsh environmental conditions on younger fish, whereas older fish, as we move into this three to six inch or three to six year old range, uh, are going to have relatively constant effects of natural mortality, but will be subject to higher fishing mortality. This population uh, takes over a number of years and it also incorporates recruitment variability, which was determined based on our catch curve residuals. 
Uh, when we look at the output for the dynamic pool model, there are many metrics that can be simulated under this, uh, this simulation in FAMS. I mostly chose to look at the change in our size structure indices and yield to inform how each of these regulations is performing. So you'll notice that we don't have any PSD memorable or PSD trophy because no memorable or trophy sized fish were produced under these simulations. I'd also like to draw your attention that earlier we already talked about PSD and PSDP uh, from our sampling results. But these are not necessarily a one to one comparison because what we're talking about on the dynamic pool model is over simulated data and the PSD we talked about earlier or over our sampling data. So here under our high natural mortality scenario, uh, meaning exploitation rate is low, we don't see any increase in yield uh, no matter what regulation. As you can see, we have a decrease here. This pro likely the result of many fish are dying before they have the opportunity to, to be harvested. We do see a slight improvement in our size structure indices uh, because as we move towards a more conservative minimum length limit, we would expect to see a greater makeup of larger fish in the population. Under our moderate conditional mortality scenario, we do again see that increase in our size structure metrics, um, but we only see an increase in yield uh, at our 16% or 16 inch minimum length limit. Uh, this is probably because this minimum length limit is the only regulation that balances uh, natural mortality and fishing mortality. Um, and so once we exceed that 16 inch, uh, moving into a 20 inch length limit uh, yield, we would expect it to decrease. And finally, under our low mortality uh, scenario, we do see an increase in yield from our no regulation or seven inch regulation to a 16 inch minimum length limit. Um, and we also see an improvement in all size structure metrics, again, larger protected here. So our overall conclusions for this study are we don't currently have any evidence to suggest that Arkansas River Pool should be managed as discrete management units uh, based on our similar growth rates, similar catch rates, uh, relative weight, size structure, and mortality uh, values all being relatively similar across all pools sampled. We do have a relatively low annual mortality rate compared to the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, which highlights our need to better understand what exploitation is taking effect on our system. We didn't see any signs of growth or recruitment overfishing for any regulation because when SPR falls below that 20% cutoff, our exploitation rate for pool data was 27%, which is greater than our total annual mortality for all pools, which is generally around 20%. And it seems our current 16 inch minimum length limit uh, for commercial harvest seems to be effective for preventing over harvest, allowing yield over various exploitation and mortality rates, but a 20 inch minimum length limit is more conservative metric uh, if our exploitation turns out to be higher than what was seen in Missouri. So the next steps for this project, again, was a two year. So we also did the same, uh, sample the same sites in 2020 for flathead catfish. Um, and again, we collected pectoral spines and we'll be conducting a full stock assessment on that from our 2020 sampling. Um, other options would be to simulate the populations for both species over other various length and harvest restrictions. Uh, some people ask for a protected slot, which protects harvest within uh, to a certain size range. And other states uh, have implemented a one fish over 30 or 34 inch regulation that we hope to be able to examine uh, once we get both species completed. Just like to take a second all everybody that helped on helped out with this project it was very uh, manpower intensive project and uh, i'd like to recognize nick felt who is my partner in writing the proposal for this project conducting the field sampling data analysis the whole nine yards uh, wouldn't have been him and then each one of these districts uh provided sampling support and um 
especially I'd like to thank Megan, who was the District 4 technician uh, who helped process uh, hundreds and hundreds of pectoral spines. And with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, who has questions for Chelsea regarding this presentation? I see a lot of, uh, I see a lot of fishery staff on the webinar. Surely somebody has a question or, or, or maybe you all know so much about it that uh, you don't have questions. They probably all helped with it. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they may be intimately <laughs> familiar with it. Yeah. Questions? All right, going once, going twice. Uh, there's Ben Batten with a comment. Any thoughts on the effects of let me disappear on the on the effects of commercial fishing? Well, commercial fishing has definitely been shown in other populations to lead to overfishing. However, from the data that we have simulated, it seems that our current regulation of 16 inches is protecting against overfishing. Uh, however, we are making a pretty big assumption with our exploitation rate. So once we know a little bit more in 2022 with our mandatory commercial reporting, we can know what fish are being harvested. There's going to be information that we can combine with what I just talked about and what comes out of those Report, we can learn what size fish people are most interested in harvesting, how many fish they're harvesting, how many pounds of fish they're harvesting. Um, and when we dovetail those together, we're going to have a much more informative stock assessment to make sure that we're best managing cat resources for the river. Uh, well, I'm talking while I'm muted there. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, yeah. uh, great, great presentation. Uh, not seeing any more questions. We will move on to Dr. Jennifer Ballard. Uh, Dr. Ballard is the state wildlife veterinarian and assistant chief of the Game and Fish Research Division. She was born and raised in central Arkansas, earned her bachelor's in fish and wildlife biology from Arkansas Tech University. Uh, her doctor of veterinary medicine from the University of Missouri and a PhD in veterinary and biomedical sciences with an emphasis on population health from the University of Georgia. She was previously with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, National Wildlife Refuges Division as a veterinary medical officer and has now been with the Game and Fish Commission for almost five years. Dr. Ballard, the floor is yours. She will be presenting on uh, an update on population level effects of CWD on Arkansas's white-tailed deer. Take it away, Jen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, right now, Jen, we've still got it in the notes format with the uh, individual okay. panes on the side there. Oh, oh, something changed. There we go. Now we've got the full screen version. Okay, perfect. It's flashing on my screen. Is it flashing for everyone else? Yes, it is, Jen. I don't know why it's doing that. If I have a seizure, would someone please call the authorities? <laughs> uh, we're we're good now. Now it's uh, now we're we're solid. Okay. All right. So my presentation is um, it's in much earlier stages. This research project is than the last uh, project that you heard. But this is to the best of our knowledge the largest research project that the arkansas game and fish commission has ever engaged in so we wanted to go ahead and give a year one update on this uh really large undertaking that the the agency has with the university of georgia so i want to give some background information about why we needed to undertake this research project 
So if you're not familiar with chronic wasting disease, it is uh, in a class of diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs, also referred to as prion diseases. Uh, these diseases, it's their own category of disease. So we know about you know, viral diseases, bacterial diseases. These are their own category, and they're actually caused by uh, the misfolding of prion proteins. Now, prion proteins are a normal component of the mammalian body, but uh, during these disease processes, they take on a new conformation. You can kind of see that in the, the little illustration off to the side. It is the same composition, but it takes on a new shape. And with this new shape, the protein becomes very resistant to breakdown, and that's resistant in the body and then subsequently also in the environment. So uh, there's a long incubation period during which animals are infected but show no clinical signs. And essentially what is happening during that time is that these misfolded prions are accumulating. They're building up in tissues of the body. But when uh, they build up too much in the brain in particular, you start to see neurons that die. The, the brain cells themselves die, which you can imagine ultimately uh, is not something that an animal lives through. So it is a uniformly fatal disease after this prolonged incubation period. Now, to the best of our knowledge, chronic wasting disease is essentially cervid specific, meaning it affects members of the cervidae which are gonna be deer, elk, moose, uh, reindeer, animals like that. But the, the nuances of the host specificity of prion diseases is uh, something that we don't know a lot about. And so there's still a lot of research to be done in that particular area. But uh, there are other prion diseases. There's prion diseases of, of sheep and goats, which is scrapie. Um, you may be familiar with something called mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which affected cattle and then was subsequently zoonotic in people. There are very human specific prion diseases. And so um, there are multiple diseases in this category. And to the best of our knowledge, this one is fairly, fairly specific to cervids. Um, I'm not going to go into much more about the specifics of our state's management plan or about the disease, but if you are a, a teacher or a student tuning in, please feel free to visit our website at agfc.com slash CWD to get more information about the disease in general. So moving on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, what brought us to the place of needing to do this research. Chronic wasting disease was first discovered in Arkansas in 2016. What you see here in this map is uh, the, the gold denotes the Buffalo National River up in the uh, Ozark region of the state. And this is where it was first detected, both in elk and in white-tailed deer. And uh, almost immediately, one of the efforts that staff undertook was to go in and do a random collection of samples. And, and it's necessary to do random sampling for disease to calculate disease prevalence. And so that is uh, what happened. The staff goal was to go in and collect 30 or sorry, 300 animals. We stopped at 266 uh, because uh, the initial results from the testing showed that the prevalence was much, much higher than expected at first detection. Uh, 62 of those initial 266 came back positive. That's a, a roughly 23% prevalence. And that was essentially unheard of at the time that this happened. I'll say that, you know, since this uh, the state of Tennessee has had a very similar experience, but most other states have had a much lower prevalence going into uh, their first detections and trying to address this disease. So uh, we were at a bit of a disadvantage from the very beginning. Now, when you break down that uh, those 62 positives, the prevalence was a bit higher in males than females, which is expected. That's been observed in other species and other states. But when you break them out further by sex and age, uh, you get down to some really small sample sizes, so you have to take this with a grain of salt. But the main thing I want to point out is really this category here that we have labeled as fawns. Now, keep in mind, this sampling was done in March, so those are not, you know, spotted fawns on a doe's heel, but they are animals that have not yet reached one year of age. Um, you already have a disease prevalence of, of 29% in buck fawns and about 20% in doe fawns. And this is going to be a real challenge to our population because those animals are going to be hard pressed to replace themselves before they succumb to this disease. What we know happens with chronic wasting disease is that it tends to increase indiv individual animal mortality rates. And as prevalence in the population rises, that increase in mortality affects population stability to the point that with uh, rising prevalence, you can have population declines. 
When you go to the scientific literature on this, there's actually multiple studies that have looked at this in elk, mule deer, and white-tailed deer. And uh, there's actually a great paper, this Ketz 2019 paper, kind of assimilated all of those, even though there were slightly different methodologies used. Uh, looked at the prevalence versus population growth. And so what you have on the y-axis here is your lambda, your, your coefficient for population growth. And when lambda equals one, and that's the dotted line you see going straight across, you essentially have a stable population. When lambda is less than one, you have a declining population. And when lambda is greater than one, you have a growing population. So um, when reconciling these different methods to one another and looking at the relationship between disease prevalence and population growth. Essentially, what the uh, reviewers found was that there was a, a tipping point. There was a point at which each of these populations would be expected to decline as a result of CWD either alone or in combination with other factors. Uh, and it was uh, related to the disease prevalence. Now, you can tell that that disease prevalence where they fall below one varies a lot, but Unfortunately, in nearly every case, we are starting from a place of already being at the critical prevalence, at least in our core CWD zone. So from the very beginning and based on the scientific literature, we had indications that we should be concerned about the population level effects that may already be occurring in our white-tailed deer from chronic wasting disease. So we put out a request for proposals. It was a competitive process. We uh, recruited universities from around the country to share with us proposals of how they would conduct this research to evaluate the population level effects of chronic wasting disease in our state's deer herd. Uh, we blinded those. We had them evaluated both internally and externally. And this project was actually unanimously selected to uh, move forward with assessing this on behalf of our agency. So our PI for this is actually Mike Chamberlain, and many of the slides that follow come from Mike's presentation that he gave to our commissioners. Uh, but he is accompanied by uh, Gino D'Angelo, uh, Richard Chandler, Mark Reuter, Candace Mathiason, uh, Edward Hoover, and Nathaniel Dankers at uh, CSU. The, the strength, really, of this proposal was that um, the folks labeled with UGA, they are from the Warnell School of Forestry, and they have a lot of experience evaluating wildlife populations. Then uh, Dr. Mark Reuter is with the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study, which is at the veterinary school at the University of Georgia, and he is very familiar with doing disease research. And then the last three at Colorado State, they come from a nationally recognized prion research center, and they will be doing all the laboratory analysis of samples that come from this study. And so you really couldn't ask for a stronger group to collaborate on helping us uh, see what's happening in our populations. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dana. She's our field crew leader. We're very very excited to have her. She's very experienced in conducting this kind of research. And she's, if you're in our Northwest Arkansas region, you may uh, meet Dana. And uh, Marcello is our PhD student at this time, but we'll be getting additional postdocs and researchers as the project moves forward. So the project objectives are to, uh, first and foremost, estimate the abundance of white-tailed deer in the CWD management zone. You can't, uh, you're very hard pressed to assess whether populations are declining if you don't know your starting point. So uh, that was one of the major objectives. And it is a surprisingly big challenge for states to actually um, estimate the abundance of white-tailed deer. Examine the survival and recruitment of CWD positive and CWD negative deer and compare those. Uh, examine the movements and home range sizes of CWD positive and negative deer, calculate infection rates by age class and sex, calculate mortality rates between positive and negative deer. And using all of that, we will ultimately move to a place where we populate a model that will help us look at the current effects of CWD on our population, the potential future effects of our, the disease on our population, and then also hopefully model out the effectiveness of various intervention methods that we can use to actually manage the disease. So uh, in the short version of what we're doing, it is a very complex project, but just uh, briefly summarizing the methods, um, we are essentially looking at three study sites and they have a gradient of CWD prevalence in them, a high, medium, and low prevalence site. Um, the team has been doing live capturing of white-tailed deer. They've been collaring a large number of deer, tagging others, uh, depending on the circumstances. They are using a live animal test for CWD, which is, um, 
it's not particularly controversial, but it can confuse some folks because we often hear that there is no live animal test. And from a regulatory standpoint, that is true. The live animal test tends to drastically underestimate CWD cases because it misses early uh, cases. Uh, so it can be used in a research setting. It's fairly effective. It's a conservative estimate of CWD um, prevalence within the study group, but uh, so they are applying this live animal test. But in case you've heard that there, there is no live animal test, you know, that's the reason. Uh, they are also using camera grids to sort of do a mark recapture type study with these animals, watching how they move on the landscape and how often they're observed. They are tracking the movements directly through the satellite collars. And when these animals succumb to mortality uh, of any cause, they are going out and uh, finding those and doing complete necropsies uh, collecting a variety of tissues. We're not just testing them for CWD. We're collecting a variety of tissues from across the body and sending those to both the University of Georgia and the Colorado State University to do um, a variety of testing and analyze uh, various aspects of their, their infection, the stage of infection and the cause of mortality. So just a couple of images to help you, you know, kind of visualize how this is happening. Uh, a combination of cannon nets, drop nets, uh, various methods just to get hands on deer. Uh, once the hands are on the deer, you know, they are uh, chemically immobilized. They, uh, their eyes are covered, uh, various measurements and samples are taken. And these collars are placed, which of course uh, transmit signals regularly to satellites. Uh, and those are then sent back to uh, computers where they are analyzed for the uh, routine movements of these animals. One of the other methods that they're using is as they catch does, uh, typically the catching season is uh, near the end of the hunting season and before fawns drop. And they're placing um, vaginal transmitters inside the does that uh, send off a signal when the does actually drop their fawns. And then they can follow that because the fawns tend to stay fairly close to where they're born for the first uh, day or so. And so they'll go looking for those transmitters and then start looking for the fawns in close proximity. And when they find the fawns, uh, there are specialized collars that they can place on the fawns specifically that help them expand um, as the fawns grow. And so part of this is helping us understand not only how many fawns are born, but then what the relative survival is uh, between does that have CWD and does that don't. So just a summary of what happened in the first field season, there were uh, 84 adult white-tailed deer captured, uh, 29 bucks, 55 does, 62 of those were collared. Uh, VITs were placed in 36 does. There were 15 adult mortalities. This was as of September. I believe uh, there's been at least two more that I'm aware of. Um, of those, it was three, three out of 15 bucks and 12 out of 47 does. The two leading causes at that time were uh, CWD and predation, uh, causes of mortality. Uh, we have moved into our hunting season. It is legal to harvest these deer. And so uh, we want to actually measure the rate of hunter harvest. So that's an important component that will uh, appear as the study moves forward this season. There's been about a 10% CWD prevalence rate in the, uh, animals that have been collared and followed and four of those deer were still uh four of those cwd positive deer were still online at the time uh, that these numbers were reported in september so this is just an example of some of the information that we can get by monitoring their movements we can compare the overall home range and habitat use of these animals are cwd positive or cwd negative deer using the landscape differently and we can also uh, look at overlap between positive and negative deer and watch for a change in the status of these animals between the time that they're initially collared and uh, then retesting them for cwd at the time that they uh, uh, succumb to mortality of, of any cause. So moving forward, uh, we will continue the field work, trapping and marking adults and fawns in 2022 through 2024. It's a five-year study. Uh, the camera grid will continue during that same time. Uh, annual CWD testing for those we can get a hold of, uh, all you know, post-mortem testing. Uh, a new postdoc will be added in 2023 as uh, our existing PhD student moves uh, forward to complete his dissertation. And the whole project and data analysis and um, the building of the model will occur uh, and hopefully come to conclusion by 2025. I want to acknowledge our partners. Uh, this is a very large project. I've already mentioned some of them, the University of Georgia, 
uh, Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources, the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study at the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, much of this work is occurring on the nat National Park Service properties. Colorado State is doing a large uh, amount of our laboratory testing. Uh, the Forest Service has also been a great co cooperator and has provided some funding for the project and uh, the majority of funding and a lot of support for the field team is coming from the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, especially our local staff in the region. And with that, I am happy to answer questions. All right. Uh, who has questions related to Jen's presentation? Jim, one, one came to mind for me, and I, I don't want to get too down in the weeds, but you talked about uh, uh, on mortality, CWD and predation were a couple of the leading causes. Now, were those deer that, or do we know, uh, and again, if I'm getting too far down in the weeds, I apologize, but were those deer that tested positive with the live animal test and then subsequently, subsequently were found deceased and, and post-mortem analysis determined they died from, they had CWD or were there any that were negative CWD at capture and then were found to have CWD later post-mortem? Um, I'm not sure that we have had any yet that have actually changed their status in the time that we've um, done this. Uh, I would have to check with the field team if that has happened uh, super recently. Most of those would have been animals that tested positive, I believe, initially, and then subsequently succumbed to the disease because we're, we're less than a year in. And so uh, for them to have already succumbed to the disease, they, they were probably getting a little bit further along at the time that they were actually captured and tested initially. Um, but we do expect to find, if we haven't already, we do expect at some point to find animals that initially test uh, not detected and then ultimately test positive uh, when they you know, die either of hunter harvest or other causes or, or CWD itself. Um, but if the team is saying that CWD is the cause of mortality, those would be animals that they believe died directly from the disease as opposed to those who may have died uh, of other causes during the incubation stage. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Well, Jen, uh, fantastic presentation. I uh, would add that uh, for uh, a little brief video review of the presentation within the next uh, few days, hopefully by the end of the week, uh, my team will have a, uh, a video about this research project. It, it aired on television, I think a couple of weeks ago, but should be on the Game and Fish YouTube channel soon if anybody wants to, to follow up uh, and uh, see some of those uh, methods in action. It is indeed a far reaching and complex uh, uh, study that I learned firsthand uh, uh, as uh, we uh, interviewed Marcelo and Dana and uh, Dr. Chamberlain and others that are involved. So, all right, Jen, uh, thanks a lot. And thanks to, and Chelsea, thank you and thanks to all of you for tuning in to this month's wild science webinar hearing about great work going on around the state by our uh, colleagues and cooperators uh thanks everybody and we'll uh, see you in december take care